Um, people ask also, why is it important? I, you know, you, you count and the Republicans and the Democrats start fighting over uh, uh, districts and, and there's gerrymandering depending on who runs the state <clears throat> government. Uh, so why should I care uh, about the census? It really is the foundation for all of our political representation. I mean, the core of the census is that the Constitution of the United States of America calls for an actual enumeration or a complete and accurate count of everybody living and residing in this country. And that is directly reflected in the number of seats in the House of Representatives that are apportioned to each state, which obviously also directly affects electoral votes apportioned to each state. Now, after that, census data products are also given to state. Uh, legislatures and, and state offices to begin their redistricting process. So at the base, you need to be there, you need to be, you need to stand up and be counted, and that directly affects uh, your political voice there. But it has a more immediate impact too. Census data underscores uh, our official estimate is $675 billion a year in federal funding alone. Um, some other folks, Dr. Andrew Rimmer from George Washington University, uh, sort of that gets a portion based on that. A lot of that money, and this is really important today as it's ever been, is healthcare related. It's health infrastructure related. It's general yeah. infrastructure related. Right. And the schools might be closed down now, they are here in Virginia, uh, you know, for the rest of the semester, but this money directly affects schools and the data about who is here directly affects planning for emergency services, planning for schools. Uh, you really do sort of shape, and so our campaign theme is shape your future, start here. And the idea is that it starts with the census. You're right, there's a lot more that goes on, but it all starts here for the next 10 years. Yeah, and thank you for reminding us that this is in the Constitution. Uh, it, mm -hmm. it is a, a backbone of our democracy is to count the people and, appro uh, and, and appropriate uh, the necessary funding um, and other resources and political representation for each state. Um, so the number of members of Congress for California, if we have an increase in population, we increase uh, our political, uh, our members of the House uh, um, for the next uh, 10 years. And that's right. Okay. for every state, New York. And also in terms of emergency funding, the same, uh, and, and I think this is how the COVID-19 issue is, is, plays a central role is that the, the, the places where you're seeing the pandemic uh, hotbeds are the more populous states or, or the urban centers uh, like New York City, Chicago, New Orleans. Uh, now it's, it's going into parts of uh, Southern Florida, um, Los Angeles, these are, these are San Francisco, Seattle. These are the areas where we need to get the funding and, and the way we count is the way we appropriate the funds, uh, the emergency funds in these situations. You know, we, we really say this, the response, this kind of leads into another very important topic about the census, which is the safety of the responses, right? So when you respond, um, all responses are released 72 years later for historical purposes. Anybody who's traced their genealogy understands going through older census responses. But right now, that data from your response only gets produced as statistics that policymakers and decision makers can use, and in some case, they've directly tied existing formulas to, that drive that money, that drive those decisions. It doesn't come out as an individual response to anybody else. So I'm sworn for life, I go to jail for five years, I uh, could be face up to a $250,000 fine if I even sort of accidentally disclose someone's census response. And by the way, I won't ever touch one because I'm not one of the people who works at the Census Bureau, whoever needs to. But that data doesn't get shared with law enforcement, doesn't get shared with any other part of the government, does not get shared with any outside groups. If a community, uh, folks in a community are concerned about maybe the number of people who are residing at their house compared to rules that the community might have or rules that a landlord might have, that's not any, that's, they can't get that information for us. So, you know, we ask for that most complete and accurate count of everybody who's living under your roof. You know, one of the parts that's the most uh, 
not, I wouldn't say contentious, but gets a lot of discussion and sometimes debates is ethnicity and ethnic uh, categorization in the census. So are you Anglo? Are you Hispanic? Are you African-American? Uh, and now with a, a large Asian population, South Asian, uh, um, Asian Pacific, Middle Eastern, mm -hmm. um, people don't know what to put. And they feel that their ethnicity is not counted. So how, how, how do you, from the Census Bureau standpoint, address these concerns of, uh, in particular, the, the MENA population, the Middle East so all, African population? Of, of course, of course, yeah. So all federal statistical agencies follow the Office of Management and Budget guidelines that were last set in 1997. Uh, the process of changing those, in fact, precisely because these categorizations can be fluid, contentious, they evolve over time, it's really got to be a research and data-driven decision. And there's an entire uh, population division of our demography folks at the U.S. Census Bureau who work on this constantly. And they're working with all of the experts in how to best categorize. The core message about it is this. The Census Bureau is about giving you the opportunity to self-identify key questions like race and ethnicity. I mean, because it's so fluid, that is what we do. So the boxes checked there might not seem like they cover uh, all of the ways folks identify today, but that's in large part because of the rigor of the process. Um, there was research ongoing prior to the 2020, it continues and it could inform the 2030, um, not only about a uh, MENA category, but it was a part of talking about how we talk about race and ethnicity, which is currently listed as two questions on the uh, on the decennial census might be combined into one because of the differing ways we talk about um, one status as being Hispanic, non-Hispanic, uh, and the racial categories, white, black, Asian. Um, for the first time ever, we're offering more opportunities for individuals who are white and black to identify their country of heritage. And uh, same for folks who would mark other race. Um, as a Census Bureau employee, I can't give instructions on how to fill it out like at all, and I wouldn't want to. Um, there are a lot of par partner organizations that have strong opinions on this, and I you know, would even encourage you to have a conversation with, um, with, with some of those uh, individuals and some of those leaders in the community uh, specifically to talk about, you know, what the community might feel about the best way to, to market. Uh, but we have tried to include uh, call-outs for heritage that would be in the MENA uh, uh, sort of general population uh, to help people understand how they can uh, reflect their heritage that's meaningful to them. I certainly mark my, uh, my uh, Pakistani ancestry when I fill out the census, which I'm allowed to disclose some of my own data if I do it voluntarily. Right. Um, you know, another issue is, is confidentiality. People feel yes. that it's an invasive uh, uh, process. And by the way, for our guests, if you want to ask a question, just go ahead and type them into the chat box. Just on the bottom, you see chat. Um, and go ahead and type your question and, and uh, Mr. Ali Ahmed will um, uh, we'll be happy to um, answer them. Um, so confidentiality, uh, people feel it's an invasive process that, you know, I don't wanna, I don't wanna give my information uh, to the government. Uh, how, how do you dispel some of these misconceptions and address these, these sensitive matters? So it's, a, it's a definitely a concern. You know, we have seen in our own sort of research and our trying to understand how to put together a communications campaign. Globally, survey participation rates have dropped dramatically, not just in the U.S. and not just when the government asks information. Uh, people are gaining a much more uh, uh, tactile and tangible idea of the value of their personal information. Um, so even as social media has increased, people get that you know, information about they themselves is a commodity. It is something that people are interested in. They're a little more reticent. Um, the most important thing we can do to motivate people, and it's the core of our message, is we talk about those tangible benefits. Um, our research shows that's what motivates somebody 
from being skeptical about participating in the census to doing it. It actually, you know, isn't talking about the constitutionality or the political representation, um, in part because I think, as you pointed out earlier, people are often skeptical of those things more broadly. It's really tying it into, look, you need to make sure your kids are counted because that impa this impacts what resources they have for school. You know, um, nowadays people are, are, we see a lot of partners sharing this message of, if you're interested in helping the helpers, then you need to, can, can you still hear me? Yeah, I don't know what happened Good. with the screen. Something is nope, 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 going on. No, 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 no problem. Okay, go ahead. Um, I'll just keep going. Yes. So if you're interested in helping the helpers, yeah. this is a way to set them up as the country recovers and make sure we have the right infrastructure for the next 10 years. Uh, but one of the ways we really punch through uh, a lot of this skepticism is with trusted voices. So we have uh, an extensive program where we engage community supporters and national supporters across the country and make sure that, you know, you might have any opinion about the government that you want, but here is somebody you trust, be it from your faith or a community leader or a political leader. And this person is talking to you about the importance of filling out the census. This person is confirming for you that it is safe and the data is only used to produce these statistics and not for anything else. And thirdly, it's really important to note, uh, as some people may have taken one of our other surveys, the decennial census is pretty short. It does not ask a lot of questions. There's the American Community Survey. That's one that's much longer. Um, it's the, for, for, for older viewers, they might remember when the census had a short form and a long form as recently as 2000. The long form isn't what you're getting in the mail, uh, when, you know, and you're not being invited to fill that out as part of the decennial census. That more granular information uh, comes from the uh, American Community Survey, which is just done on a statistical sample, a large one, so a lot of people have taken it, but it's just done on a statistical sample. And that provides a lot of like of the really rich data that helps us with things like Voting Rights Act enforcement, et cetera. How has the uh, population of the United States changed in the last 30 years? Um, what are the trends that you see uh, that people would be, you know, may not, may not, it may not be so obvious to uh, the average American? Well, one of the ones that's really made an impact on our, uh, you know, the planning for the census and on our communications campaigns or the area I work on is the diversifying population of the United States of America. The population is becoming much more diverse. Um, and in that process, even the categories of what people uh, consider race and ethnicity, like we were talking about earlier, those are changing and evolving and, and adapting to a different world. Um, the population is aging, uh, uh, but then amongst some of the new arrivals and descendants of more recent immigrants, you actually have like a surging younger population. Um, it is a complexity to accomplish when it comes to trying to run a communications campaign and reach everybody and motivate them to participate in the census. Um, you know, one of the biggest hurdles is since it only comes once every 10 years, folks have a lot of time to uh, forget the what they did last census. You know, there's always a large new generation that's a now out on their own as a renter or an owner of their own place for the first time that uh, did not participate during the previous census. Um, and as that population diversifies, we need to think about how to reach them. So we, we have a campaign that is running uh, advertisements and has media outreach and partner outreach in 13 different languages, that, uh, including, including English, and that those 13 languages cover about 99%. Um, but we have materials in a total of 59 non-English languages, including American Sign Language, uh, because we really need, we have did a deep dive study of the population groups by need and wanted to cover as many people as we could with well-researched, um, fully vetted and translated materials to explain what the census is and how to fill it out. And in order to, to, to make sure that, you know, everybody understood. And, and by the way, that still doesn't cover everybody in this country. So we've tried a lot of more local solutions. Uh, mm -hmm. We hired certain uh, staff that has language skills for special populations and smaller communities. And 
we work with other outside experts where we can to kind of patch the difference um, because you have a lot of very small communities in this country that have special language needs and it's really just trying to make sure you can reach everybody in the census is, is one of those challenges of a diversifying America, but it's a, it's a worthy challenge to meet and overcome. By when will you have the, the actual numbers? So we have a statutory deadline to produce numbers by December 31st of this year. Um, and that, by the way, is just the top level numbers, the state population estimates and for Puerto Rico, the ones that inform apportionment. Uh, it takes a lot longer and it's not even really till next summer that you would see under a normal timetable, you'd see a lot more of this granular information and different data products from the census, uh, from the decennial census. Um, importantly though, you know, we've suspended our field data collection operations. We are looking forward to how we're going to restart those. So right now we have a, a one plan, but that is being worked on day and night by the folks that handle the operations. And we'll be providing sort of more updates on the timeline for releasing information as soon as we get them. Um, a question from uh, a guest, uh, Mabruka Hassanain. How can the immigrant community trust the government after what happened with the Latino community and ICE? So I think the concern about sharing this information with immigration and customs enforcement with national security agencies, uh, intelligence agencies, um, how, how are Americans assured that this information is not shared with them? It is protected by Title 13, or in plain language, it's protected by the strongest privacy law in the federal government. Responses, your data come into the Census Bureau, but nothing comes out but aggregate statistics. And not only that, those aggregate statistics are put through the most rigorous, uh, what we call disclosure avoidance possible, which is to say, we even make sure we release statistics in a way that you can't reconstruct them in order to create databases to re-identify people. Um, do we share information with foreign countries uh, or share the demographics that we get from the census uh, or share it with the uh, national security entities of, uh, of other governments? No, certainly, certainly not uh, in terms of the responses we get. Now, those aggregate statistics that have been, uh, you know, protected by sort of disclosure avoidance methods, those are released publicly. So certainly, anybody could access those and they do around the world for all sorts of important uh, uh, needs when it comes to, you know, studying population. Um, but we don't share with any foreign government or anything like that uh, uh, responses, just like we wouldn't hear with our own domestic government, domestic national security agencies or domestic law enforcement. We do have a division uh, at the Census Bureau though, uh, which I don't think is the intent of this question, but important to know, where we consult with foreign governments and try to help them do their best census as possible. And we really have a, a passion and a commitment for two things. One, releasing the most accurate data possible about the world around us and protecting the privacy of everybody who gives us their information. How often is the census reformatted uh, in regards to the, in other words, in, in regards to the types of questions asked to address populations and needs? I mean, it's put together basically every 10 years. Um, the 2030 census planning is currently underway, more at like an operational stage, how are you gonna do it? Um, but it is different. I, I think it's safe to say it's been different every time, certainly in the recent, recent past. It will always, the questions are always designed to answer Prob, uh, uh, answer questions that policymakers need to know. So everything we ask, whether it's on the census, the American Community Survey, or one of our other surveys, is designed to inform a decision that needs to be made by policymakers or answer a question that stakeholders like state governments and local governments and uh, the academic community need to understand in order to, to, to go about doing their business and, and making these data-driven decisions. Are there any questions that a person can refuse to answer? So we encourage everybody to fill out every question on the census. Um, item non-response is definitely a reality. Uh, so what mostly we encourage you to get your response in, uh, but we do encourage everyone to fill every question out. Um, if you leave a lot of questions blank, there's a chance there could be some sort of quality assurance follow-up, uh, which would mostly come in the form of a phone call. That's by, the, by no means, is that something that goes to everybody? I just wanted to make real clear there is some of that work that goes on, but it's not about enforcement, it's about data quality and assurance. So please get your census response in, 
but please consider filling out the entire response because all of the information is important. Does this have an impact on social service agencies uh, for ethnic communities like the Arab American um, um, social service uh, uh, offices, Pakistani American, mm -hmm. uh, in the MENA population? Are they impacted by the census in terms of how much funding they can get uh, from the government? So, uh, uh, won't specifically answer that. I can, I can look up our sort of larger report about everything that's influenced. Um, but absolutely, service agencies in general are very impacted by census response because that those statistics help inform how uh, sort of money flows. Um, a lot of communities are impacted uh, through grant funding as well by census data and statistics. Um, even if they have to separately apply for the grant, the base of the information about the community they're serving is informed through census data. I will just note really importantly, like we don't share with any law enforcement or national security agency, we also don't share this data. This data won't be used to directly affect anyone's benefits. Like you can't cut off benefits because of something that you reported on your census, maybe in terms of the number of persons living in your household, let's say. Um, likewise, too, there was briefly a rumor uh, uh, floating around among some communities that a potential stimulus check would be impacted by whether or not you had responded to the census. Uh, same deal. We don't share that information with anybody. We don't share it for the, the cutting of benefit checks or for uh, denying eligibility to benefit checks. That's not a part of what the census is about. That's not a part of what the U.S. Census Bureau does. You know, there's a lot, a lot of debate about how many Muslims uh, are in the United States and the census does not cover religion. But is there a way that the government does uh, count how many Muslims uh, and how many other religious groups, religious minorities in particular, uh, comprise this, uh, this, this country of ours? So the Census Bureau doesn't uh, conduct that question. It's actually part of the federal law to say that it won't ask about uh, religion. Um, Pew, uh, the Pew Charitable Trust fund research that does a deep dive into religious affiliation in America. Um, there is a lot of great statistics about that, um, but it's not a part of what the, the Census Bureau counts. And I think, you know, the intention behind that is very good, um, you know, in terms of, of separation of church and state and also, uh, you know, avoiding some of the categorization problems that have existed in the past and in other countries too. Thank you so much for your time, uh, Ali Ahmed of the Census Bureau. We really appreciate your expertise on this matter and we'll be calling upon you again uh, as we move forward with uh, completing the census.